Hey, historians, welcome to another fireside chat on this Sunday evening. Just touching base with you on what was some rather discouraging news this past week, and that is regarding the closure of campuses uh, for the remainder of the year. Um, and while this was a great source of discouragement for me, um, I found myself reflecting humorously through laughter and tears over our time together uh, so far this past year. And uh, just wanted to take a few moments to commit to you um, that we're going to finish what we started uh, in August. But before we get into uh, that, we have to have tea. Tonight's tea in honor of our classroom is peppermint. Mm. Ooh, have you had hot peppermint tea before? You must. It's awesome. We do have a full week ahead of us. We've got the period five um, review that we'll be doing, parts one and part two. We have the multiple choice that we'll be doing. And this week we will have a major grade, um, and that will be a timed 45-minute DBQ. So once you get that started, you'll have 45 minutes to complete the full DBQ as opposed to it broken down in various boxes. But we'll save that discussion for Monday and Wednesday during our Zoom meetings or through Remind messages um, because that's curriculum-based stuff and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later this week. I, I want to focus more on just kind of touching base with you um, human to human in the midst of this, uh, this pandemic that still continues. And I wanted to, you know, I was digging through a wide variety of books <laughs> to uh, bring leaders forward, John F. Kennedy or Franklin Roosevelt or Eisenhower or um, Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, any of their wise words to guide us. And I realized, and I've been saying this time and time again, that we are historians, right? We are in the midst of history. We are creating history. And if you are a recreational writer, um, not writing something like a DBQ or something for AP Lang, but a recreational writer, I encourage you to journal a little bit about what you're experiencing during this time period. Um, you'll find that when you go back years and years later, you'll not, you will have not only written history, um, but you'll be able to provide a primary source for what life uh, was like uh, amidst this crisis. So I'm sure we'll hear primary source documents from nurses on the front lines, from grocery store clerks on the front lines. Um, and so I think you have an incredible voice in this time period to really narrate history. What is life like for you as a high schooler um, not finishing your junior year or for those seniors that are listening um, their senior year on campus? Um, that perspective is going to be unmatched, um, hopefully, uh, by anybody else in the future. And so what you're able to journal, what you're able to chronicle during this time period is going to provide some very rich primary historical documents for the future. And I'm not mean it like, oh, you're going to be a DBQ someday. But, but you know, we do often, right, um, read about, oh, this was a journal from a soldier during the Civil War. This came from a diary entry um, of a young lady during Republican motherhood, right? So I encourage you to create history by kind of reflecting on your thoughts during this time period. And I think it's important for a teacher to reflect on their thoughts during this time period. So I don't want to um, read from another president or another leader tonight, but I want to read you um, something very personal. I want to read you what I've been reflecting on and what I've been journaling on during this time period and, and see if it resonates with you. So this is um, not a, a, a formal right. This is a very casual kind of journaling right, but this is a history teacher living through the COVID-19 pandemic and expressing their thoughts uh, in the midst of this history. So uh, if you want to uh, join me for just a few minutes, I'd like to read uh, to you what I have kind of come up with. I've often read through various news articles and social media posts the plight of introverts. Their struggle is real. I hear them. I see them. This time of social distancing has often been used both ironically and humorously as a benefit to those who legitimately feel uncomfortable in social situations. But little has been said about the plight of extroverts 
during this unprecedented time of isolation. I think it might be fair to assume that many, certainly not most or all, teachers are to some degree extroverts. I know I am. As an extroverted person, I'm fueled by the energy of a group. I thrive on lively discussion, on numerous questions, on animated personalities. And at the end of an incredible school day, my tank may be empty, but my heart is full. Simply put, that feeling cannot be replicated unless I'm in a classroom. With the announcement of the closure of schools for the remainder of the year, part of me shut down. I can't fully explain it, and I do not know how to cope with it. Perhaps some teachers out there will understand. But during these past four weeks, there was some small sliver of hope kindled within my heart that we would go back, even for a week, to tell the students goodbye. This is not possible now, especially with my seniors whom I've journeyed with since their freshman year. I mean, sure, we can Zoom, which is now a pandemic era verb. I could write them a letter or I could even record a video. But that will not replace the opportunity to see them strut down the hall with their backpack in tow and their AirPods in, fist bumping them as they enter the room, closing the classroom door after the bell rings, turning down my blaring music on Spotify and standing in front of the room and delivering what I egotistically think are my words of wisdom for their journey ahead. So for now, the organic nature of the classroom is gone. Sure, online learning is still continuing, but as an extrovert and as a teacher, it is not the same, not even close. As an extrovert, I thrive on controlling the energy of the room, ramping up the lesson to a fevered pitch and bringing it down to almost a whisper. I love knowing where the punchlines are or how they're going to react to video that I'm about to show. My former department chair and a consummate educator himself aptly called that edutainment. Now, some colleagues have chided this behavior as showboating or being more of an entertainer than a teacher. And to that, I hear their plight and I understand what they're saying. But to me, in my philosophy, teaching is more than just delivering content or enforcing curriculum compliance. The cornerstone of my teaching philosophy is relationship. Once I've built that relationship with those students, they will go through a brick wall for me. And I most certainly will go through multiple brick walls for them. My day, not usually, but always begins at 6.30 a.m. sharp. I have 10 to 15 minutes to get a cup of coffee and make some copies before my cadre of students, which I call the morning crew, hangs out in my room before school. We've developed quite a bond and a love for the fact that they find my room a quiet respite before their busy day begins. We've had some great conversations and insight into their life and what happens to begin to now, at least in my life, become my morning coffee club. And at 7.20, my first period, a small class of 20 with a wicked sense of humor, make their way into the classroom. They get my puns and my bad dad jokes, my terrible mannerisms in class, but they have a great love for the content. And they have a special place in my heart because they are such champs for learning about Andrew Jackson's bank war at 7.30 in the morning. Now, second period with 27 students, that's the brains of the operation. They're the GPA chasers. They're the quiet, smart group, not wanting to talk, small talk, or even get me off task. They want the notes, they want the material, and they want to get to work. Shut it, Nasosi. Just give us the goods. And then there's my fourth period, the nut house of 32. Right before lunch, their energy is unmatched, and I love them so even though each one of them should be committed to an insane asylum. 
They know exactly how to get me off topic. They know how to make me laugh uncontrollably, but yet work so hard when they get down to it. And if they push too far, a simple Nasosi look can get them back on track. My tiny and sweet sixth period is only 19. It's like a small little family. We have our inside jokes that nobody else will get. We have nicknames for our class. We do have that one wild uncle, and they do have the smarts and the street smarts that are unmatched. And then I get to the end of the day with my beloved seventh period, a group of 25. Half the class seem like they're best friends already. They roast me just as much as I roast them. And yet, through their humor and their incredible sarcasm, they do some of the best work that I've seen. And that's just my U.S. history classes. I have an academic decathlon team that can make me cry at the drop of a hat with their tenacity and their hard work, all while marching towards state competition, and all while pushing them to near Bobby Knight volume with my Get Back on Track and Associate speeches. And then my after-school bunch of over 110 Model UN students who are the nerdiest bunch of future global leaders the world has yet to see. This group of kids, seriously, hangs out in my room after school debating South American fiscal policy for fun. I've been all over Texas with them and had the most memorable time in Washington, D.C. this past February. And all of this, with one simple press conference, by the Texas governor is gone. That quick. None of all of that energy can be replaced online. So tonight, I'm sad. And I'm fully aware of the plight of millions of people around the world and in this country tonight. There's unemployment and possible eviction and repossession. Healthcare workers are burning the candle at both ends. Patients are clinging on to life or worse, passing on with family members that have to plan a memorial that no one can attend. Grocery store employees are exposed every hour by a myriad of customers who still refuse to wear a mask while small businesses face closure. I get that, and I see that. But for this brief moment, I just wanted to share the story of a teacher who learned this past week that he will not be going back into the classroom until August, and to me, that is just as tragic. The classroom is not just a room where learning occurs. It is where all the facets of life are exposed in a setting that is unmatched anywhere. The classroom is filled with the nervousness of the first day of school, the tears on the last day of school. The classroom has your desk, which you proudly show to your parents at open house and is the first place you return when you are home from college on Thanksgiving break. The classroom is where a lifetime memories have made, and in fact, memories that many people even have today. In fact, you could probably still picture one of your classrooms exactly the way it was from years past, and it is my hope that students this year will remember our classroom the way it was. Students, as I've been talking to them, could not wait to get out of that classroom before spring break. I'm guilty of that myself. But all I want to do is go back. And it is my hope that they want to go back too. And it's not for the PowerPoint lessons. It's not for the packets or worksheets that they're filling out or even the tests that they're bubbling in. But it's for those relationships that have been built. It's for those moments of laughter those moments of inside jokes, and if for no other reason, the delicious mints on the back table. The classroom is not just a room, it's an extension of me. And for this extrovert, for this teacher, I will miss it so. And more importantly, the beautiful souls that fill those desks each day, at least until August. So for now, historians, we might not be going back to that classroom, but we can at least recall the memories that we've made there and continue to be energized by the future memories that we're going to make not only here online, but in that classroom in the future. I promise you, we're going to get back together this summer 
and we will be getting back together next year. But for now, we're going to Zoom and we're going to communicate through Canvas and we're going to have video recorded messages and that's just the way it has to be. And so I'm going to do my part to give you 120% of me in these next few weeks. And I hope you do the same. Thank you for indulging me for a few moments while I just read some of my thoughts during this time period. And just know that you are missed and that I hope you are well and I hope that you are still plugged in and that you still have the energy and the fervency uh, going into not only our exam for the sake of taking an exam, but just for the sheer pride of completing what we started. So we might be done in the classroom, but we're not done with our relationship and we're not done with our online learning. And I can't wait to see you back here tomorrow. Be well and be wise. And uh, period five coming up next, American Civil War. I'll see you then.